Kursky to state what must be very obvious, that this is an extraordinary judgment delivered in an extraordinary way in which the Commission is clearly deeply troubled by the case it's having to decide and by the limitations placed on it by the Supreme Court. And the implication, the outcome that we face is that no British child who has been trafficked outside the UK will be protected by the British state if the Home Secretary invokes national security. I think you would like to say a number of things, Daniel, but we have a number of collective things to remind you of when you read the judgment. Uh, I think what, what really jumps out of the judgment is what the Commission didn't say. What they didn't do is endorse what Sajid Javid said in September 2021. He said, you haven't seen what I saw. If you did know what I knew, you are sensible, responsible people. You would have made exactly the same decision of that I have no doubt. In fact, this Commission, which saw exactly the same material that Sajid Javid saw, didn't say anything like that at all. He described the case as finely balanced and said that reasonable people might strongly and profoundly disagree with what, with the, the way in which Ms. Begum's case has been determined. So, I, do you want to say anything more about trafficking? I think repeatedly you'll see in the judgment the findings that the Commission finds a credible suspicion that Shanima Begum is trafficked, a credible suspicion that she was harboured by the traffickers until 2019, a credible suspicion that there were extraordinary failures within the UK in preventing her, failing to prevent her and her friends travelling. Reading the factual underpinning of what the Commission considers to be made out on this Begum's behalf, you, you would feel that there will be no way that she could not have succeeded in her appeal. But you will equally see, repeated as a threat through the judgment, how the Commission invokes the Supreme Court's view that its role is limited and cannot consider the merits of a case. It's limited to the most narrow grounds of administrative review. In consequence, you have a judgment in which the court is effectively saying, as things stand now, we are stuck in a way that we do not think reflects the findings we are making. So uh, that's basically it. I mean, in, in terms of the legal fight, that's, that's nowhere near over. We're not going to go into details about exactly what that means at this stage. I think what, what else this judgment calls out for, though, is some, some, some courage and some leadership from the Home Secretary to look at this case afresh in light of the clear and compelling factual findings that this court has made. Thank you. We don't. The decision by the site court today denying Shamima Begum's appeal is, of course, incredibly disappointing for her and her family and all those people who expressed support for her right to return home over the years. The court did accept that Shamima Begum was a traffic person. She was groomed at the age of 15 and trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation from her home in the UK all the way over to Syria. This fact, however, they considered did not displace the Home Secretary's rights given to him by Parliament to strip her of her citizenship. Now, this is something that we ought to think about as a nation. We've sleepwalked ourselves into a scenario where our politicians now have the powers to reach out into our lives and radically change them. At the same time, our courts have very limited powers, it seems, to revisit those decisions and reverse them in a direction uh, which is morally attuned. Now, as a country, we now stand almost exclusively alone in the idea that we don't have to take responsibility for the citizens that travel abroad. Every other nation has revisited their position on that and reversed it. The fact that we stand alone amongst nations where we don't take responsibility for our citizens is something we really ought to think about. 
and any next government that comes into power, we, the citizenry, should really examine what powers we've given them and whether we're comfortable for them to continue to have those powers when the courts have limited ability to keep them in check. Something to think about. Now in a TV exclusive, documentary filmmaker Alan Duncan is set to reveal damning eyewitness accounts that put Shamima Begum at the heart of terrorist training camps in Syria, where she would have learned to use guns and even build suicide vests. Alan, a former British soldier who later fought alongside ISIS, uh, sorry, later fought ISIS alongside the Kurds, sorry, uh, went on to undertake painstaking interviews with Yazidi sex slaves who suffered at the hands of the group. His latest bombshell interview with a young woman who was kept prisoner by ISIS for seven years reveals Begum was even friends with a slave master who oversaw the rape and kidnap of girls as young as 14. So, look, Alan, your findings about Begum are incredibly shocking. Uh, I think it's so important that you've done this work because, of course, what we've seen over the past couple of months, Alan, is this attempt by the BBC, or the British Bashing Corporation, as I call it, to rehabilitate Begum, uh, to try and claim that she's just a victim. So please reveal uh, exactly what you've found out. Um, actually, this witness that um, is on camera, uh, she's all she's done is confirm what I've been told by other witnesses. However, they can't go on camera because they're involved in trials or they... I, yet again got family members held still by ISIS. But yeah, um, and one of them was telling me that Begum was even recruit, trying to recruit ISIS females as suicide attackers. Wow. And I've got that on camera. Wow. And so, so, so these are people who were effectively uh, prison, ISIS prisoners of war, who you're now speaking to? Um, you, could, you can't even call it prisoners of war. Um, the Yazidis were captured en masse in 2014. When the world woke up to ISIS on that mountain, that was the Yazidis you've seen fleeing. Women and children getting sold by ISIS, um, that's the Yazidis. You can't call them prisoners of war. They were basically sex slaves raped and abused for years by ISIS males and the there's not an ISIS one single. Okay. There's not a female. What? There's not one Western female that was not involved in that slavery. Also, in now, fact, what... the Yazidis have told me in many ways the women were, in some cases, worse than the men. And what we're seeing on camera here, Alan, uh -huh. is you actually showing some of these victims pictures of Shamima Begum. Uh, so, so can you go into a little bit more detail about what they told you about Begum's activities? Because, of course, we've always suspected, we've always had hints at the fact that she was helping male suicide bombers, she was even potentially putting them into suicide vests. But what you've found out actually moves this on, doesn't it? It shows uh, that she was actively involved in the ISIS terror campaign. Yes, she was actively involved. What set the alarm bells off for me, to be honest, was, a hus was her husband, when I interviewed her husband. He confirmed to me that she was getting wages from ISIS whilst he was seemingly in prison. Now, I know from interviewing other ISIS, you weren't getting a wage for sitting at home. You had to be actively involved within the organisation. So I've been told that she was... Um, she was in Sharia classes. She was getting trained in weapons. Uh, suicide belts were standard, normal thing there. But I've also been told that she was actively uh, trying to recruit females. She was, her friend was selling Yazidi women and children. Now, uh, the witness said to me, I can't say that they were best friends outside of the classes. However, they were best if they were that only the two of them were hanging about. If they were hanging about together in the classes, trust me, they were best of friends outside. But her husband also, his reaction during the interview as well to the Yazidis, that set alarm bells for me, myself as well.
Indeed, indeed. So actually, it looks like Begum, and there is her ex-husband, by the way, who you interviewed, it looks like Begum could actually have been far more involved uh, in the terrible, despicable deeds of ISIS than has previously been reported. So how do you feel, Alan, when, when you see the BBC uh, doing what I have described as some sort of propaganda puff piece to try and paint Begum as a victim? Because I believe uh, you had some harsh words for her previously. Oh, yeah. Um, well, what can I say? It's not only the BBC. You've got the Times that made her into a front page cover as if she's some sort of... Yeah, cover girl. There's a, a whole celebrity agenda. Cover girl. <laughs> There's a drip feed and agenda within the mainstream media. You've got Reprieve. You've got the BBC. You've got the Times. You've got other journalists within that clique as well. They're all trying to drip feed you that ISIS females are now suddenly victims because they fell for the bull. They fell for that bullshit. I witnessed that change at the very start when I was interviewing them. Suddenly, they were, instead of saying, well, I had one that said to me, they weren't sex slaves. They were slaves that you could have sex with. That, for me, sums up all the Western ISIS, including Shamima Begum. They didn't have a problem. But tell me something. This mainstream media, blatant for, blatant for Shamima Begum, an ISIS terrorist, and also, it's not about Begum only. She gets back, they all get back, and not one of them will stand trial. Sami Hussein's the perfect example to why they won't stand of trial. Course. And we will end up funding her for the rest of her days if she ends back in this country. Look, final, final word, Alan. Uh, you actually believe ISIS brides like Shamima Begum would pose a clear and present threat to British uh, security if they were allowed back into the country. Why? You have to bear in mind, with ISIS, it's not a lost war, it's a lost battle. They think a generation ahead, whereas you and me think a month ahead, a week ahead. For ISIS, it's a long-term goal. Their loyalty is to the caliphate. It's not to Britain. It's not to the country that they come from. It's to the caliphate, no matter how long it takes. Really disturbing stuff. Uh, incredible work exposing the truth of Shabima Begum, uh, which for some reason the BBC refuses to do. Really, really pleased that you've shared uh, your shocking findings with us tonight. That is the documentary filmmaker Alan Duncan. This is as near to a sad face I can find in all the footage. And the eyes are down, the lips are arched, but they're not down in a reliable form by pulled by these muscles, depressor muscles that pull the lip corners down. She's forming this pitiful face and it's been posed because we can see it's being created by the chin boss being pushed upwards. When we see children do that, we call it a pout or a sulk. So this was a very poor attempt from Begum to try and display sadness, to attract sympathy, to have her case reheard, appealed, to allow her to move into the UK. You can do anything. You're living under Islamic law. Yeah. Did, did you know what Islamic State were doing when you left for Syria? Because they had beheaded people, there were executions. Yeah, I knew about those things and I was, I was okay with it. Did you ever see executions? On the one hand, the severed head unfazed you, and on the other hand, you are angry about a person. Because it's one thing, because you have to remember that these people, they, the, the, their beliefs are that you kill the non-Muslims, but you treat the, the Muslims, you know, good. Was there a point where you started to have second thoughts about your life in Islamic State, under Islamic State? Just only at the end, like, after, after my son died. We crossed the border. It was just a big field of nothing. And there were like men wearing all black with their faces covered with guns in, on, like, in the, on their arms. And it was just a bit surreal, you know, seeing it in person. What are you thinking? I mean, at that time it was kind of exciting. Really? It was kind of exciting, yeah. It was different. It was... You weren't thinking these men are dangerous, these are no, potential no, terrorists? No, I thought they, they're here to protect me. They have these guns to protect me. 
and to protect women like me. We've always suspected, we've always had hints at the fact that she was helping male suicide bombers, she was even potentially putting them into suicide vests, but what you've found out actually moves this on, doesn't it? It shows uh, that she was actively involved in the ISIS terror campaign. Yes, she was actively involved. What set the alarm bells off for me, to be honest, was, a hus was her husband when I interviewed her husband. He confirmed to me that she was getting wages from ISIS whilst he was seemingly in prison. Now, I know from interviewing other ISIS, you weren't getting a wage for sitting at home. You had to be actively involved within the organization. Uh, my friend was getting my wage, her wage. Luckily, they did give that, yeah. Salaries are getting less. Less. How much, less. How much did they drop the salaries to? Both of you get the same. Both of you get a wage. Both of you get the same. Both of you get a wage. So uh, I've been told that she was um, she was in Sharia classes. She was getting trained in weapons. Uh, suicide belts were standard, normal thing there. But I've also been told that she was actively uh, trying to recruit females. She was her friend was selling Yazidi women and children. Now, uh, the witness said to me, I can't say that they were best friends outside of the classes. However, they were best if they were, the, only the two of them were hanging about. If they were hanging about together in the classes, trust me, they were best of friends outside. But her husband also, his reaction during the interview as well to the Yazidis, that set alarm bells for me, myself as well.